for those who are suffering alone or suffering without Christ, and then they're asking, well, then what's my payoff? You know what I mean? They weren't prepared through the voluntary, you know, self-denials, voluntary suffering. Can they, in their trial at that moment, it's not too late, right? They can find God and use it at the same time. That could be their martyrdom, right? Like they can, there's still a purpose for the everyone. Thief on the cross, the right hand thief, uh, one word is all it took. So certainly I, I think that many people who are non-believers, suffering can be. Again, you know, we said one of the one of the reasons for suffering is to awaken us. So if if suffering can bring about uh, for somebody who doesn't believe to, to think more seriously about their mortality and about the possibility of eternal life and, and, and faith in God, and they turn to him in that very moment, so they could be saved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are, there are saints who speak about this beautiful notion that sort of God is working on the human soul to the last breath so that there are people that we think they died as unbelievers because, you know, we didn't see the last moments or the last seconds of their life, but it could literally be the last breath where they said, Lord, have mercy on me. Yeah. And that was enough. I think Elder Paisius, he tells a story of a family that came and that was very distraught about, I think their, their, their son or a child or, or somebody related to them who committed suicide by jumping off of a bridge. You know, and they were, of course, very distraught. Like, you know, is this person saved? And the other Pisces could say that as he threw himself, he said, Lord, forgive me. Have mercy mm -hmm. on me. And he said he was saved. Lord God. Right? So, it, you know, so, so it doesn't take much. At least, th again, this is this is what the experience of the saints t teach us. Mm -hmm. So then in, in this case, it's almost futile or foolish to ask the question, what alleviates it or if i get back to the right path does that save me from suffering or that's not the point right the point is gaining from it yeah again i think the point is not to do something to alleviate uh well let me let's let me look look answer that in two ways number one uh, you know the more pious we are the more religious we are doesn't mean we're you know we're protecting ourselves from suffering could be the contrary right like uh so so it's there's nothing we can do in the Christian life to avoid suffering, let's say. Um, and so, like we said earlier, uh, we don't seek suffering, right? But we also don't avoid it. But in saying we don't avoid it, that doesn't mean we don't um, do the humanly sort of necessary things to remove our self-will. What I mean by that is that if I get sick, I don't say, well, okay, if it's God's will, you know, he'll heal me. No, God's will is, is revealed through the human means that are available to us, right? So I go to the doctor, you know, I do a surgery, I take medicine, and what's left is God's will, right? Like, this is actually the, what's beautiful about Tamav Irini, another contemporary saint at our church, um, is that from her biography, we are told that she sort of sought um, the cross of illness. She, she, she desired to be a martyr like her beloved uh, St. Mercurius Abusfin, and uh, it, that wasn't God's will for her. But So she asked for the cross of illness. Now, you might say, okay, well, then if she asked for it, then that's it. Whatever, whatever came to her, heart disease, whatever, you know, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, or whatever, then she would just, you know, be passive. To, but no, she went... She did surgeries. She flew across the ocean to America to do surgeries. She took medicine. She followed up with doctor's appointments. Why? Because she needed to remove any presumption on her part or any self-will on her part. Okay. Uh, so, yes, she did suffer much from physical ailments. But she, again, she had to do everything that was humanly possible in order to discern, again, what was truly God's will and not her own will. But you keep saying we don't seek it out, but she sought it out. Like, what's the difference? Yeah, there? so early, earlier I said, again, like some of the saints sometimes asked for things that are, are, are not meant for everybody to sort of imitate, right? 
uh, have you heard of, for example, the Fools for Christ? So the, the Fools for Christ is a sort of category of saints in, in, in the Orthodox Church in which some saints sort of took upon themselves this sort of extreme form of asceticism and um, foolishness and hiddenness of their virtue, um, sometimes acting in crazy manners, you know, to deflect from their sanctity and to, you know, sort of trick people as to wondering whether they were saints or fools, you know. Um, and again, sometimes a saint might have a unique calling from God. I, I want this person to sort of do this unique mission for the church, to be a fool for Christ. It's not something any of us can choose. Right. It's like Father Fanus. Or yeah, or Abu Niyostos or mm-hmm. Abu Abdul Masih al Um So these are examples of saints who were called to something that we're not all called to imitate. Right. So I would say that, you know, the same thing applies to the example that I gave of Tamab Irini. That, you know, she received uh, perhaps a, a, an inspiration that this request was acceptable for from God and and she requested it and it was but it's it's not something that all of us again because it could be very presumptuous on our part mm. you know like I said about mm. some of those who thought they could go and be, be martyrs and um, and then ended up renouncing Christ so from the earliest time father um, uh, the martyrdom of Polycarp St. Polycarp is <clears throat> excuse me St. Polycarp is a disciple of St. John the Evangelist the theologian and uh, his martyrdom is written out in the first few paragraphs. The, the time is taken to uh, to to digress from his, his the story of his martyrdom to comment about the foolishness and the um, the unacceptability, if I could say this, uh, to to go and present yourself before governors to say I'm a Christian, kill me. Yeah, and. As Father mentioned, as Father Krulus mentioned earlier, a lot of the people who did this <clears throat> ended up uh, renouncing the faith but because they thought serious? they had they thought they had the courage mm-hmm. to do so. And once they were, but our synaxarium has tons of those cases. Sure, and 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 I think the synaxarium and Father, please correct me. I think the synaxarium mentions this as a specific, um, as a specific calling, as spe- mm-hmm. a specific gift charism as a vocation to Mm -hmm. i i think in the spiritual life it's very important that we so uh, uh, going to some theology a little bit like spiritual theology the theology of of the life of holiness and the life of perfection right we extract certain universal principles from from the experience of the saints beginning in the Old Testament, right? Uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and um, into the New Testament and into the history of the church, right? So we take from the experiences of men and women who lived the life of the Spirit and we extract certain principles that apply to all of us, right? But there are many things that happened in the lives of the saints that are not meant to be extracted and applied to everybody. For example, very simply, the well, what I call the charismatic gifts. Like, so we think like St. Pope Carlos the Sixth, mm-hmm. right? There are certain things in his life that we can say, all of us need to learn from this, right? But not all of us need to learn how to do miracles, nor do all of us learn how need to learn how to cast out demons, yeah, clairvoyance, right? Or <laughs> yeah, that, right. So there are certain there are certain experiences in the saints' lives that were unique or were, were given for the building up of the church, the edification of the church uh, that aren't meant to be applied by everybody, right? And so even when we read the Synaxarium, right, we have to be careful that some of these extraordinary events and, and accounts of some of the things that the saints did, again, there could, there could have been a, a, a real personal inspiration or a knowledge that this was God's will for them But it doesn't mean that we look at them and say, oh, all of us have to do that, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the discernment part is really important. In in suffering, in carrying the cross, in in being obedient, all of these things need discernment, right? I mean, even even the the simple virtues of uh, silence, humility, obedience need discernment, right? Because you could could give somebody the silent treatment 
And that's not a good silence. Hmm. That's a form of aggression, right? Sure. And so that's not, uh, that's not discerning the virtue of silence in the proper way. Somebody could obey somebody in a very dangerous way, and that's not uh, healthy, and that's not using discernment, right? So, so all mm-hmm. of these things need discernment, which is why we don't do these things alone, right? We have the church. We have our spiritual fathers. We have our communities. We have the writings of the saints and the, the fathers of the church to guide us. Mm-hmm. 